They needed to do something that would get people to sort of look at them, particularly when they weren't going to be able to be on every channel all day like some of their competitors were. Um, so they really needed to sort of break through. Um, and so we sort of proposed something that was, let's, let's find a way to speak that no brand or none of your competitors will speak. And, and for that, you need some humor. Um, and so we sort of said, let's break down this um, taboo around speaking about money in a way that people can engage with and feel um, and have a laugh about. Um, so we originally pitched this concept. And at the time, I remember they sort of were like, is this a joke? Um, and we said, sort of, <laughs> but here's <laughs> out. Um, and the concept used David Schwimmer, you know, Ross from Friends, um, as a sort of an observant, observant, sort of dopier version of himself, who gives permission to the Brits to laugh and acknowledge the realities associated with money. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. In 1957, Vance Packard wrote a book called The Hidden Persuaders about the mysterious arts of advertising and how advertising agencies research ways to manipulate people. I don't know about you, but I don't know about you in your career. Like for me, I'm not that guy. I don't want to be that guy. The way I see it, companies create value. And in a capitalist society of choice, they need to communicate that value to the ideal customer so the customer can perceive it. Which is why when I read a lesson like authenticity is fundamental with a real advertising story behind it in a podcast guest application, it resonated with me. That lesson comes from Tom Guyton, Managing Director at Joan London, and he's joining me right now to share the story behind that lesson along with many more lesson-filled stories. Thanks for your time today, Tom. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. Well, let's take a quick look at Tom's background so you can understand who I'm talking to. Uh, he was account executive at Saatchi & Saatchi and & Deutsch. He was business director at Gray Group, Senior Board Account Director and New Business Director at AMV BBDO, Head of Business Leadership at McCann London, and for the past five months, Managing Director at Joan Creative's London office. Joan Creative was named Small Agency of the Year by Adweek, at which point the magazine reported Joan had $20 million in projected revenue for 2022, an 80% year-over-year increase. It's been in business since uh, 2016 with a New York office, and Tom opened a London office six months ago. So Tom, as I mentioned, you are now the Managing Director at Joan London. Give us a sense, what is your day like as Managing Director? It's it's different every single day, Daniel, and it's um, exciting to work at an independent creative agency that's sort of getting its feet a little bit. So my day can be as varied as I can spend time looking at carpets in the morning for our new office to then uh, dealing with some of our big clients and, and thinking about building brands and, and how we create modern legends. So it is an incredibly exciting and terrifying and exhausting um, sort of adventure that we're doing, but we are. We're doing it because we believe that in the Joan uh, sort of staples and the things that Joan believes in. And, and we're bringing that to London in the London Vienna audience, which is really exciting. Great. Well, as I mentioned, you have kind of gone the rounds in the advertising industry. A lot of bold face name agencies. Now you're an independent. Let's see what we can learn from the things that you have made in your career. Because I like to say, I've never done anything else. I've never been a podiatrist or an actuary. But I don't feel like everyone gets to leave work having made something, right? We actually, I actually had a portfolio a book here. Look at this. This is all the things I've made. And that's what makes the job fun for me. So let's take a look. You mentioned your first lesson from something you made, as I, I kind of read at the top. Authenticity is fundamental. So... We hear this word a lot, authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. but tell us, how did you actually do it in the campaign? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. And authenticity, you know, you talked about sort of the the belief that advertising is just sort of trying to trick consumers. And I and that's something that we've always sort of had to deal with as marketeers. But I think the reality is that consumers, when they see something that reflects their life in a true, honest way, they are more believing in the brand message and the things that the brand is trying to say. And, and for me, this sort of came to life uh, most um, overtly in 2013 when I was working on the Gillette business. And Gillette was um, a really interesting brand because they had been with their previous agency for decades. And in 2013, Gray, um, Gray Group won them um, and mo it moved over, the business moved over. And I think what was fundamental to this sort of 
comms around that was it was based on this sort of beautiful, renewed idea of modern shaving. You know, Gillette's comms for the 90s, 80s, 90s was almost comically unrealistic. You know, it was the, the bet, let's say the best a man can get had become a bit dated. Um, it sort of had this 80s feel, which was, um, you know, the man always had an exorbitant amount of shaving cream on. And Gillette ads have this uh, thing that they call the J stripe. It is a um, a shave stroke that goes down the jaw and through down past the neck. And it's in every Gillette ad. Um, and, you know, in the early 80s, 90s, that was done. And it was this beautiful stroke that cleared the every inch of the shaving cream and not, left no hair on the face. Um, now, I shave. <laughs> I mean, I know I don't look like I do now when I have a beard, but I have shaved and I have never, ever had a shave stroke that looks like that. You know, it was the most comical thing. There's always at least, you know, Gillette has the sharpest blades, but they always leave at least a hair or two. And there's always a little bit of shaving cream left. Um, so it was for me, even as someone who shaves, that didn't reflect the the thing that I was seeing in my bathroom. So we, as part of this new campaign, really set out to correct this. We wanted to present shaving like it honestly looks like in a normal man's bathroom. So we reshaped the entire J-stripe and the entire shave. So it was messy, but it felt more real. It felt more authentic. It left some hair. It left a little bit of shave cream. Um, but it really resonated with consumers. And I think we evoked the same aspirational authenticity in everything we did. So we cast differently. We didn't cast you know, the same models who had been in everything. It was more regular guys. It was guys who looked like me who maybe had a little tub in their tummy and, you know, had a little extra um, around the towel, but it reflected people in an honest way. And I think it helped to elevate the Gillette brand and it changed the way that they marketed. And it was, you know, for a, uh, an account that had been at a pre the previous agency for decades, this was a huge step for them to move. And I think the reason that they chose Gray and chose us was because we were able to demonstrate that authenticity was truly at the heart of what they were trying to do. You know, I haven't, hadn't really thought of it until you mentioned this, but when I was in high school, I didn't really have anyone to teach me how to shave and it started as a bloody mess. And, uh, and I think one reason is the only thing I, I mean, this was before the internet where you can easily get information. It was just the commercials and I was like swiping away <laughs> and cutting myself up. So, I mean, I had a single blade razor, which was part of the problem. They were just cheaper, but uh, that's, that's a really good point. But let me, let me ask you also. So when you talk about this, this is great. And this is a great example of being authentic when there is a literal representation of the mm. product. But a lot of times with advertising, I mean, it's figurative, it's storytelling. And so I wonder if you've ever led a brand through how to still keep that authenticity, yet when it's a little more figurative. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, I reported on a, a company called Bubby's Fine Foods. I don't know if they have this in the UK, but here they're one of the biggest like pickle purveyors in, in grocery stores and they use this natural fermentation. And so, you know, in Yiddish, a Bubby is a grandma. And so, you know, it's got a grandma on there and it's got this feeling of a grandmother. And, you know, like, yes, the original founder, you know, was a grandmother. And yes, the actual picture on the label uh, that the brand was bought by bankers and the actual picture on the label is one of the, the bankers grandmothers. Mm. But really, it's not, you know, some little grandmother making it in a, in a kitchen. Um, but they play that up. They play that up in their messaging. They have this video series called Taste the Chutzpah, which shows, you know, how they, they make it. Uh, the little bubby character on the on the front uh, has a little you know word bubble coming saying eat my pickles wear clean underwear marry a doctor you know so they play it up the food itself from what I can tell is genuine it was natural fermentation but clearly it's a character and they're they're kind of doing this whole like advertising storytelling character thing so I wonder in your experience I guess that was a great literal example of like you know in my case I got bloody because of that Gillette commercial maybe um, but what would when how about when we're doing something more figurative how do we still keep that authenticity while having this kind of storytelling character kind of message driven approach yeah it's an interesting question and I think one thing that I've I've always understood is it, everything has to be based in a true insight. And, you know, we, we worked on, um, on a, on a supermarket here in the UK brand. And one of the things that we were talking a lot about were, you know, the, the non-traditional holidays. So the, the non, we're not talking about the Christmases and the new years, but the, the Eids and the, and the holidays that might not necessarily been marketed in the, in, a, you know, traditional ways in the past. Um, and I think one thing that we really wanted to focus on is making sure that we 
have a true belief and understanding of how those experiences are um, celebrated um, and making sure that we can bring in those little bits and stories. So, for example, one time we were looking at doing a sort of holiday campaign. Um, and as we thought about uh, Christmas, someone mentions, you know, in my Jamaican family, we celebrate Christmas with these sorts of foods. And there is this sort of tradition that happens at the table before we eat. Um, now, that was something that none of us had ever experienced or knew or understood. Um, and so by just making that small tweak so that we, you know, covered the food in that uh, excuse me, the table and that kinds of food as we as we shot the ad and giving that single moment, it resonated with an entirely different audience and brought an even more authentic story to life. Um, and while it may not have registered with everyone, because not everyone has this Jamaican tradition, the audience that it did created a, a new place for us to uh, to communicate and a new way for us to sort of connect to those consumers. So I do believe that there's such interesting and opportunities to create authenticity and to create connection through that authenticity. Yeah, I mean, my favorite all-time advertising quote is the truth well told, mm -hmm. right? I think I'm in the can or whoever McCann, it was. And yeah. So yeah, like you said, it's like, yeah, you've got to find that truth. And that is kind of the fun thing about being in this industry, learning about people and finding their truth. Then still, you're going to tell it well. Like, it's going to yeah. be shot at the golden <laughs> hour. It's not going to be, you know, with kids running around screaming and hitting each other when they're having that, you know, kind of Jamaican Christmas. But exactly. um well, let me ask. So, so another uh, version of that is also like, how do you change a brand over time, right? A brand mm -hmm. has a heritage. What it was once, is it still today? I mean, we've changed so much as a society. You mentioned keeping a brand modern helps to drive longevity. So how do you do that? How do you balance the two? Yeah. One of, well, one of the things Joan believes in as a company is that we're really focused on building modern legendary brands. Now, the belief is that brands are either modern, and you can sort of think of those as your up and coming brands. They're the ones that sort of Take a, come into a category, blow it up, change it. Um, those are the modern brands. But then there are also those legendary brands, the brands that your parents bought, that you still buy. Um, those are the brands that have been around for ages. But the ones that it can, can achieve both, both modern and legendary status, those are those iconic brands that you know, are made to last forever. Um, and, and that's what every brand is trying to do. It's They can reinvent themselves for the next generation. So... Um, one of my favorite examples of this is, is in 2017, um, I was working on Bird's Eye, which is a, a, a British brand for the most part. It's frozen uh, foods. Um, and it's one of the most iconic British brands. It's been around for ages. Uh, and their captain, which is their uh, spokesperson, um, is called Captain Bird's Eye. And he, to this day, is one of the most iconic British icons. So he is always listed in the top 10 people who are most British uh, after the Queen, uh, rest in peace. But she's all he's always on that list. Um, but in the back half of last dec the last decade, Bird's Eye, despite having this massive brand icon, was really losing share. Um, and they were not quite sure what was driving it because they'd always sort of been top of the category. They were the ones who sort of led the, led the stride um, for family foods. And what we realized was that a new generation, this millennial generation, were becoming parents, and they had were much more health conscious than their predecessors. So they were thinking about, we want to give our children the healthiest food options that we can. Um, and for some reason, they believed that frozen foods and bird's eye uh, food specifically, specifically their fish fingers or their fish sticks, as we call them in the States, um, weren't an incredibly healthy option. Um, and so we really had to sort of unpack what is driving this? Why, you know, they grew up eating these. Why are they not still finding these to be healthy and, and still considering them? And what we realized was that this Captain Bird's Eye, who had this sort of comical, cartoony sort of representation, wasn't aligning with these brand health claims. So you, you were sort of having someone talk about real food who's not real and has a parrot on his shoulder and is fighting pirates. So it didn't, it didn't mesh those two messages, the visual representation of the brand and the messages and the claims that we were making didn't make sense together. Um, so we really needed to bring this captain into the modern age, bring, make him feel more reflective of the, the things that we are trying to accommodate now, which is a healthier way of life. Um, without losing the brand attributes and the icon. So we didn't want to walk away from this icon who everyone knew and grew up with. Um, we just had to find a way to reflect a more modern version of it. So 
what we did um, was recast the captain. We said, let's relook at a, what a modern captain would look like. He, we, let's keep him, but let's make sure he reflects, you know, who we are today and the kinds of things that we want to stand for as a brand. Um, so we took away the, the parrot. We took away the pirates. We made the captain a, a sort of sexy, older, you know, silver haired man um, who had a family, had kids of his own and grandkids of his own. Um, and then we sort of tied that with these same messages around health food. And it really changed the way people perceived the brand. Um, and it changed the way that people thought of uh, the captain. Suddenly he became this weird sex symbol and was sort of all over uh, the press as this sort of like new, interesting guy who you wanted to, you know, feed your family um, in a way that the captain never had before. And so it gave us an opportunity to sort of elevate the brand, uh, grow the category in this new way, and really land this real food proposition uh, that frozen food had lost along the way um, and allowed consumers to sort of see themselves reflected in this, um, in the captain and, and, and in his family. And so it provided us an opportunity to sort of bring this brand into a modern world um, in a really fun, exciting way. So I love what you say there. It sounds like there's consumer research to really kind of get in their heads and understand this change. So that's the consumer side. Talk, talk us through, what do you do on the business side to work with the business owners and help make sure the value proposition is right? Because maybe sexy isn't what they're going for. Like, how do you align with that, that business side? Because, for example, I interviewed uh, Derek DeTenber, the chief marketing and merchandising officer from Batteries Plus on How I Made It Marketing. And one of his lessons was understand the purpose of the business. And he, mm. he talked about how you know, rebrandings at Wendy's and Massage Envy to, to, you know, brands he was working at. It's like that was kind of a key part of his role too, not just the customers, but what is the purpose of the business? What do we want to be? Yes, customers want a certain thing, uh, but then we have to decide what do we want to deliver? Some of it we might want to deliver for that customer. Some of it we're not, you know, the right company for. Yeah. So how do you work through on that side when we're talking about rebranding like that? How do you work with the business owners and make sure you're aligning with their value proposition, not only following customer wants and needs? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And I think this is a great example of that, of following the business, because the business did want to move into a healthier food space. You know, we understand and recognize that health foods are the, the generation or is the way that we're moving forward. And so it in all sort of communications for this for bird's eye, they wanted to talk about healthy food and they were hindered by doing that because of the way in the, the communication sort of tools that they had at their in their arsenal. Um, and so there was a reality based on the larger brand story, which is they wanted to be talking healthier foods and across all of their um, their products, but they couldn't do it. Um, and I think that's fundamental is just it needs to be focused on what you want to achieve as a brand in the next five to 10 years versus it being about a sort of a consumer need. And I think had it we weren't able to do it with the captain. I think there would have been a true conversation around, do we walk away from this brand icon in order to achieve our, our business goals? Um, but hope, but luckily we were able to, to do that while still keeping on to that icon. Yeah, I like that because I, I think we have to be careful about not letting the tail wag the dog, so to speak. Like exactly. It's so important to understand consumer wants and needs and where things are going, but also who we are as a business because you yeah. can't chase all of that, right? You have to stay true to yourself. Um, Staying true to yourself for business, I love this story. As a bank, I wouldn't think this is the obvious option to go. You said all sorts of brands can benefit from humor. So how did you bring humor to a bank? Yeah, it's a, it was a it was an interesting conversations that were had through this. And I, I think, you know, finance, particularly here in the UK, has traditionally been a very tedious, mundane category. Um, I know in the US, you know, the Alec Baldwin work with, with Capital One, that was the beginning of sort of using, using humor in a financial world. Um, but in the UK, you know, there's some cultural truths that sort of hindered us from doing that same sort of thing. Um, you know, there's a, a famous sort of unspoken rule here in Britain that you never talk about money publicly. It is not something you do. And it is known for all classes. So whether you are, you know, very wealthy or working class, you never should speak about your money problems publicly. Um, so that to then bring in humor into this, that made things even more complicated. Um, and for TSB, who is an established sort of British brand, um, they were sort of losing their way in early 2020. And I think consumers didn't necessarily understand or appreciate the products that they had and their communications were getting lost from in, within their consumer set. So they were never going to be able to spend as some of the other banks had. 
Um, so what they really needed to do was sort of shock and awe. They needed to do something that would get people to sort of look at them, particularly when they weren't going to be able to be on every channel all day, like some of their competitors were. Um, so they really needed to sort of break through. Um, and so we sort of proposed something that was, let's, let's find a way to speak that no brand or none of your competitors will speak. And, and for that, you need some humor. Um, and so we sort of said, let's break down this um, taboo around speaking about money in a way that people can engage with and feel um, and have a laugh about. Um, so we originally pitched this concept. And at the time, I remember they sort of were like, is this a joke? Um, and we said, sort of, <laughs> but here's <laughs> out. Um, and the concept used David Schwimmer, you know, Ross from Friends, um, as a sort of an observant, observant, sort of dopier version of himself who gives permission to the Brits to laugh and acknowledge the realities associated with money. Um, and I think what the client loved was this authenticity of the humor. So it, yes, it was funny, but it was based on a sense of this is something that everyone goes through. Again, money is one of those things that no matter if you have tons or none, you still are stressed about it. So it um, and it led in, it leaned into that. It leaned into that belief and that understanding. Um, and so the the humor was all about you know talking about money, talking about and feeling comfortable talking about it. Um, and which is very not British. And I think because David was an American actor, Hollywood actor, it gave him the ability to sort of be an outsider speaking on behalf of the rest of the world looking in at Britain. Um, and it gave us an ability to sort of focus on the nuances of the everyday British life um, and British person. Um, and it was shock. It shocked people. And I think it really, particularly that it was David Schwimmer, because, you know, he's a famous person that everyone knows. Um, but it also gave people an ability to sort of laugh at finances and laugh at the sort of mistakes that they make when it comes to money and, and those nuances that they do in their own families as it relates to their finances. So um, it drove massive reconsideration for the TSB brand and that people suddenly were sort of shocked that they had this spokesperson, but also that they were willing to do the do this sort of humor um, when it came to the sort of brand that they were trying to build. And it really helped us to to grow the brand in a big way. So was there anything you learned from getting to work up close with David Schwimmer or someone like that? Because one thing I've always thought is, you know, advertising and marketing, we're not so different from entertainment and comedy, right? They're, they're trying to do a lot of the same things we are. They're setting up a value proposition, whether that's setting up a joke or whether that's setting up, hey, I am this character, right? And then they have to pay it off. They have to live that character or they have to get, you know, the ultimate conversion, a laugh. And so, you know, sometimes I think we're, there, there's a lot of similarities there. So I assume you'd got to work with David Schwimmer, maybe went to some of these suits, or at least, you know, were involved in some of these ads. Did you learn anything from working, you know, up close with someone like that who was on, you know, what, like you said, one of the biggest comedy shows there's, there's ever been? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that we learned, even as an agency team, was the, um, the importance of ab-libbing and the importance of, again, living in a moment. So David Schwimmer was spectacular. We wrote amazing lines, lines that I thought were some of the funniest lines that I had ever seen um, for him. And once we were on set, you know, and there were things that were happening, David Schumer was able to react to things in ways that we never would have expected. Um, and and ad lib, and, and I mean ad lib, not only just uh, from words, but even in his facial expressions that brought different types of comedy to, to life. And I think that was something that we continued to take back into our creative development process as we looked at the next generation and the next year, um, is how do we continue to sort of build on this? There's only so much that you can sort of build for, but how can you accommodate to allow people to change and, and the creative to develop as things happen? And, and, um, and that was, I think, one of the biggest learnings we, we had. Well, in the second half of the podcast episode, we talk about lessons we learned from the people we got to build things with. That's two great things we get to do as marketers. We get to build things and we get to build them with other people. Uh, not often mega celebrities from friends, you know, often uh, CMOs and art directors and copywriters, what have you, but still we get to build them with other people. Uh, but before we get into lessons that Tom learned from people he collaborated with, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by Mech Labs Institute, the parent organization of marketing. Sherpa. You can get 10,000 marketing experiments working for you with a free trial of the MechLabs AI Guild at mechlabs.com slash AI. 
That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S dot com slash A-I to get the most value from artificial intelligence for your marketing. All right, with that, so as I mentioned, you know, we get to work with people. We get to collaborate with people. That's a key thing we do as marketers and advertisers. Uh, the first people you called out, you said you learned trust in failure, and you learned this from Lisa Clooney and Jamie Robinson, the founders of Joan. So uh, take us to, into the story. How did you learn this from them? Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the first things that drew me to Jamie and Lisa was their transparency. Um, I remember when I first met them, I was like terribly nervous, and they were too very visible women in the industry who are at the top of their game. And I sort of had this imposter syndrome that I know, you know, most people get. I think we all sort of get this fear that we're not deserving of the things that happen in our career. And for me, particularly, I sort of always have this sense that I've somehow like locked into certain situations. Um, and so when I do meet people that I look up to and heroes, um, I'm always sort of there's a little bit of me that's like, they're gonna find me out, they're gonna know that I'm not really supposed to be here. Um, and so I remember when I had my first meeting with Lisa and Jamie, um, maybe foolishly on, on my part, I sort of admitted this. I admitted that I had this imposter syndrome. Um, and they were sort of talking to me about the possibility of joining Joan and, and, and creating something together in London. And I sort of wanted to just be honest and say, you know, there's a little part of me that just wants to make sure you know that what you're getting into. Um, and I remember Jamie said, point blank to me. She said, don't we all get that? I have that right now talking to you. Um, and they were both really open about sort of the failures that they'd had, um, had been just as important as the successes as they created Joan. So, you know, Joan has been around for seven years and they always talk to me about some of the mistakes that they've made. And they are very open about, we've made tons of mistakes, but that has helped us to grow and to build and to become the kind of company we want to. Um, and so the, the pitches they say that they've lost have been have provided just as much learning as um, the pitches that they've won. And so I think that sort of belief in failure and the importance of it um, was something that I loved that they acknowledged right from the get go. And, then, and, you know, in our first meeting to sort of say, like, well, we all have imposter syndrome, Tom, like, get over it um, and just lean in. That made me believe in the, what they were trying to build and made me feel uh proud and excited to sort of do something different. And the, the, the thing about Joan that I always love is it's built on this need to break conventions. You know, like our industry isn't perfect. The marketing industry has some issues, let's be honest. And I think Joan is set to sort of break them and, and change them. And as we think about how do we make really inventive, exciting work, you know, there's you're going to make some mistakes along the way. And so you have to believe in the importance and the possibility of failure um, in order to sort of have trust and that you can take that next step. And that was a big thing that Lisa and Jamie told me right from the get go, but have continued to, to sort of say throughout. So that was that was my big trust in failure. I, so, you know, if you come on how I mean it marketing and you say one of your lessons is trust and failure, I got to ask you about one of your biggest failures and most <laughs> lessons, but well, I'll let that sit for a beat because that's a harder question. I want to ask you maybe an easier one at first. Uh, so take, you know, you're, you're talking to the founders of Joan. We, we mentioned for the past six months, you built Joan London. You built it with, as I understand, Christy Hathaway, you also mentioned, who I think is the head creative. So you're more on the business side and she's on the creative side. I wonder what you've learned about kind of uh, fostering that relationship between the business and the creative side when you're building an agency, if you've learned anything in it. Because from my experience, I, I came up more on the creative side as a copywriter. Talk about imposter syndrome, man. <laughs> you, you, think, you think the AEs and the managing directors, they have imposter syndrome. Every time I got a job starter, I'd be like, I don't have any more ideas. I'm a total phony, like every new job. And obviously you get rolling, you figure it out, it gets there again. You have a gr you know, great, great uh, campaign or whatever, but then you get the next one and it's that same imposter syndrome again. Like I got nothing, <laughs> I'm tapped out. <laughs> so, um, so from your perspective, you, again, you're kind of on the business side. Have you learned anything about building an office, building a, you know, a, uh, and you've seen a country with the creative, like what roles we both play or how to work together. Yeah, totally. And I, Kirsty is the best partner to have. And we always joke that before we even agreed to do this together, we sort of had this dating 
where we would like go for dinner and have drinks and sometimes too many drinks and really get deep into sort of our feelings and our emotions about what we wanted and what how we wanted to build it and how we wanted to work. And um, Kirsty is, because Kirsty comes from a very sort of different background as it related to sort of advertising, she is much more editorial. She's been working in fashion. She's, she's sort of done things differently than I've done in my traditional sort of marketing background. And I think that has provided this beautiful sort of relationship between us because she comes at things differently and comes at things differently than other creators I've worked with, which push me to be thinking about work differently. And um, I sort of push her to sort of be thinking about more traditional marketing, ex- you know, with my marketing experience. Um, and so we've really created this sort of world where we have to trust each other because we each come at it in a different way. Um, and it, it gives us an opportunity to sort of ask why and also why not. Um, on everything that we do, which I think helps to make the work stronger and the and the relationship uh, flourish in a big way. All right, now in fairness, I think we need to get into that failure <laughs> lesson, uh, Mr. Gidden. But, you know, and I'm joking around, but failure, I think, is really key to advertising and marketing. So I'm glad you bring it up. You mentioned we have to ask why not. When we ask why not, I've had this happen in my career, sometimes we, we find out why not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was a good reason and we have a failure. But by doing that, we're working with our brands to push the envelope, right? To actually yeah. push that creativity. So do you, can you think of a lesson you learned where like, hey, it was a mistake or a failure, but wow, you really learned from that? Yeah. And I think why not is a, is a good question because I think you also sometimes realize that it's not, you're not uh, focused on the right question. Um, so I think one of my biggest failures was a pitch for, I will not say what brand because I'm not going to, they're still out there and I'm going to get them one day. But I think, you know, we, we often get pitches and I think agencies go for it. They, they take the brief and they run and they think they build work that they think will change this brand in a big way. And I think sometimes our failures are that we don't ask the right questions of the brief. So I think we believe we understand what a brand needs without necessarily really diving in and understanding what, not necessarily what they say they need, but what they actually need. So um, I think one of our biggest failures was a brand gave us a brief. And I think the brief was pretty clear. They said, you know, they needed some big populist work that would sort of change the way consumers saw them. Um, And that's what we did. We gave them a really unbelievable script that was populist, could have been played on, you know, big Friday night primetime TV and would have changed the way the brand worked. I think the reality is, we didn't do enough due diligence on our side to really interrogate the brief and ask them, is this really what you need or is this just what you think you need? Um, And I think the brand that inevitably won did do that. They asked the right questions. They really probed and said, why do you need this populist campaign? Because in in reality, everyone knows who your brand is, but what you need to do is drive reconsideration. You need people to think of you in a different light. And by just doing the same thing that you've done, which is these big, Brett Bold campaigns, um, you're going to continue on the path that you're on. Um, And so it's one of those things that continues to always be in the back of my brain, which is don't just do what people (laughs) say they want you to do. You need to really probe and make sure that you're reading between the lines as much as you are just taking their word for it. You and know, that and goes appreciate- beyond marketing too, I will say, Daniel. <laughs> no, virtue. And I appreciate you mentioned that because I get asked a lot this question, and maybe you've got to ask too, like in an era of AI, what is the point to having a writer or art director or agency or, or any of these things? And I think it's what you said. It's, yeah, you can have an AI and tell it what to do, and it could probably do it super quickly and cheaply and maybe okay. But I mean, a real, if you're a real copywriter or a real AE or any of those, those things, it's not delivering on a brief. It's helping and questioning and, and, and being an advocate for the customer and helping that business understand where they need to get, which is not always where they think they need to get. So I think, I think that's a great example there. Um, let me bring up now, there's the next lesson you mentioned, how to embrace empathy and authenticity in leadership, set boundaries and stick to them. Authenticity has been a common topic with you. We talked about authenticity in terms of for a brand to its customers. I think this is more for us individually in our careers. You mentioned you learned this from Jessica Tamzedge, the CEO of Dentsu UK. How did you learn this from Jessica? Yeah, Jessica um, has been sort of a mentor and friend of mine for a really long time. She was my boss at two agencies, so both at Gray and at McCann. Um, most recently, she most recently she was the chief client officer for McCann Europe while I was there. 
Um, and I think much of my career success has been because Jessica, as my boss, took a true interest in what I like to call my full self. So you bring yourself certain part of, of yourself to the office, but there's the other half of you who lives at home with your spouse and your children. Um, and for me, um, she has always been an incredible champion for finding the right balance between those two people, those two sides of my coin, if you will. Um, and I've always wor I worked with Jessica at some of the biggest life moments, <laughs> uh, you know, of my my life. So, you know, Jessica was my boss when I first got engaged and, and got married. She was my boss when we adopted our son. Um, and throughout all of these sort of major changes, Jessica was always there celebrating alongside me as much as she would celebrate a big uh, new business win or a big campaign being finished. Um, I remember the Monday I got after I got engaged, I got engaged over the weekend. The Monday I got after, Jessica had was waiting at the elevators for me to get on the elevators to celebrate with me. Um, and that sense of, you know, your professional and your personal life's uh, melding was a really important lesson for me. And I think um, most importantly, she was one of the first people I told after we, um, our adoption was finalized of our son. Um, and after she sort of finished crying, <laughs> she made this big effort to help me create a schedule to ensure I was able to get home and spend um, enough time with him every night. Um, so I carved my work day around his needs versus around the client needs and things that I sort of had always focused on. Um, and Jessica had been an amazing example for this because she was sort of famous for every day at five o'clock, she would go home and pick up her kids and then would you know log in online after. And that was something that sort of her commitment to that every single night was something that was sort of famous in the agency and, and really an amazing example for me. Um, and so I think this sort of belief in the authenticity of, you know, empathy and, and in leadership is something that has really stuck with me. And it's something that I want to ensure that my team and the people who work at Joan London can bring their full selves and their, and their full successes. So whether that's a success uh, on their client business or um, the work that we create or success at home, I want all of those things to be celebrated in our office because I think it makes not only better, but more loyal employees. Um, and it makes you uh, feel like you can do the best that you can do. And that's what sort of we need to, um, that empathy is what we need to be doing more of in our business. And it's something I've sort of strived to, to do here at Joan London. So I like that. I hear you. I agree with that. I know you're kind of probably our new crop and generation of leaders feels that way. How do you do that? Have you, have you learned any, any specific tactics you do any specific rituals? Like, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. I interviewed, uh, Jake Watts, Vice President of Marketing at PDI on how I made it in marketing. And one of his lessons was that leadership happens outside the boardroom. And he talked about also why empathy is the greatest hidden competitive advantage in organizations. And he mentioned, you know, like, I mean, as a company too, that's what they have. They have their people. And he, he had a leader who showed him like someone on his team, I think, and had lost his son. You know, it was, it was tragic. And, and he just saw this leader up front how he dealt with it, how he'd like go to this guy's house and sit with him and just, just all these different things he did. And then he realized, okay, that's what I want to take forward. I want to like understand people's lives on my team enough for that. And then I want to be there for them in those moments where if it means, you know, going to their house and sitting with them after like losing a child, you know, whatever that is, like I, I want to be someone who does that. Um, so for you, it's a great lesson you got to learn early in your career from a key mentor, a key leader, um, what, you know, how do we, we, we talk about this? We talk about this empathy. How do we actually act on it? Are there any specific rituals or management devices or whatever that you use to do that? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's something, you know, that we've done at Joan London specifically is ensuring that we are, um, we create, you create your own schedule for the day. So I think, you know, when I was sort of growing up, I was at the, I was at the sort of a, a master to my boss. So whatever they needed, I was there and available. And if they wanted to work until 10 PM, well, I, you were stuck in the office until 10 PM. I think the thing that we've really focused on at Joan London is like, you have to get your work done and we have to do what we need to do, but we do it on the time that makes sense. So there are people, everyone has sort of, there's a lot of people with children at Joan London and what, everyone has their own sort of schedule where some have to go pick people up from nursery at four or some at five and at six. And so what we tend to do is at the four around four meeting stop, for example, and then they might 
you might get emails from 7 to 9 p.m. or whenever people can come back online. And that practice is not only um, acceptable, but encouraged. It's encouraged to sort of find that right balance. And we're never the type of person or company, shall I say, that is going to mandate you work from 9 to 5 um, because that's not realistic and it's not going to encourage the best work from people. So I think that practice in itself is only uh, helps to sort of bring that, that full self to work. Um, and, and I think the other thing is that as we've become a more, uh, a community that is more based at home, you know, and working from home and the, the flexibility that provides, it is something that only continues to be amplified this in this need for empathy and the empathy for one's home's life. So I, I, I can only in, see this increasing as we move forward. You mentioned picking out carpet for the office. Have you figured out what that mix is? Is it a hybrid or people coming in? Like, how do you have you balanced that? Yeah, we found a good balance. And I think, you know, we're, we're tending to do three days in the office for now. But I think what's great is that we are a small team and we enjoy being together. So people are coming in more often than I think we've ever uh, needed to sort of set any rules, which has been really fun. And I do like to think it's because of the carpet I did eventually choose that people want to be in the office. <laughs> Boy, this is some carpet. We got we to gotta share a picture when we publish this article. Um, all right, so those relationships within our organization are obviously so important, and you've talked about that. But then there's the relationships across the organization. You know, marketing is so much about this kind of agency, uh, marketing organization dichotomy. Uh, so from your perspective, that would be the clients from, you know, the CMOs and marketing people listening. That's the agency. So let's talk about a story about how you reach across and have those good relationships. Uh, you mentioned humanity and transparency is fundamental in creative relationships. And you learned this from Emma Springham and Keith Gulliver, the CMO and head of brand at TSB, the bank we mentioned earlier. So uh, how did you learn how to have a good creative relationship, again, across that agency brand divide? Mm. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, Emma and Keith are, are some of my favorite client agency relationships I've ever had. I think they are both incredibly smart. They're incredibly diligent clients. Um, they're constantly raising the bar, the, excuse me, the bar for sort of creative excellence. Um, so a lot of clients do that. <laughs> I'm not sort of suggesting that they are uh, the only ones that do those sorts of things. Um, and I think we had a really spectacular sort of relationship to begin with. I think we pushed each other, we really were able to find the best creative output. Um, I think one of my favorite moments with both of them was, again, around this adoption of my son. And I think um, each of them individually pulled me aside and spoke to me um, quite sort of emotionally about the reality of family life. Um, you know, Emma had uh, two young daughters, and I think she was really, it, for her, it was really important that I took proper time off during um, paternity leave and really focused on building that relationship. Um, Keith had two young daughters too, and he also was sort of, um, was very open about how difficult he found paternity leave. And um, as we continued to have sort of conversations around our family and our lives and how we, we meld those two things together um, in our careers, it was an opportunity for us to be more open, more transparent, um, because we were able to bring our humanity and our truth um, to the, the relationship. And I think this compassion made our professional lives much stronger. Um, it then, so then, as we had already had sort of these open dialogues about our family, when you start to look at creative with that, within that lens, um, it creates an opportunity to be more honest with one another. And I think one of my favorite moments was when I we were initially pitching a new creative idea. I remember I sort of pulled Keith to one side and said, you guys would be nuts to do this, but you'd also be nuts not to do this. Um, and I think it was one of those moments that, you know, that's a true client uh, agency relationship where you can sort of be honest enough to be like, this is kind of out there. And and they take that, you know, and in, in, in the way that it was intended, which is really open and clear. Um, and so for the, me, that humanity is what made that relationship as strong as it was. And it, it created us an opportunity to sort of make the kind of work that we were able to make. So in a relationship, like in a, like in a marriage, for example, I think what you've talked about are some good techniques like to have a good marriage. But also it's like you got to pick the right person, you know, <laughs> like no matter what techniques you use, if you don't pick the right person. So I was wondering... 
you know, we talked about at the opening, 80% year over year growth. That was before opening the London office. You talked about pitches. Again, we, we tend to want to win pitches. What do you do to make sure that you're bringing the right clients in, getting the right balance for those clients, getting those right relationships? Uh, you know, for example, interviewed Carlo Cavalloni, the global chief creative officer and partner at 72 Sunny. And one of his lessons was, if your client is not as ambitious as you are, you're not going to do anything great. And he told the story about uh, Alessandro Benetton, the CEO of Benetton, and working with him on the Unhate campaign. And they ended up winning, you know, a Cannes Grand Prix, right? But they did it because they had a really ambitious client who, you know, really pushed the envelope. So for you, you know, we, we hear so much, I think the tech industry so much drives our business news. And it's just about this ridiculous, screeching growth, 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 growth. But an agency is a services business, and that growth can mean something very different, can be difficult to scale. So what do you do? How do you make sure you get the right clients in to have those type of relationships? Yeah, it's a really good question, Daniel. I think the way I always think about it is an agency is as much of a brand as the clients that we work with. Um, and I, you know, one of the things that we always talk to clients about is like, do you truly understand what your brand is and what your brand needs to be in order to, to uh, connect to your consumers? And I feel like agencies need to do the exact same thing. I think um, there are lots of agencies that have been around for decades and have sort of these uh, themes and these values that are sort of posted on the wall, but do they really stand for the same things that they did 10, 15 years ago? Um, I think what's really excited about, exciting about Joan is that it is a up and coming independent agency. And we truly understand and believe the kind of brand that we want to be which to your point, then makes it easier for us to understand the kind of clients that are right for us. So some work, for example, that we just did with a brand called Luna Daily, which is a sort of a, a femcare brand. And they have the same ambitions that we do, which is to create work that breaks conventions and sort of works outside the barriers of traditional marketing. Um, and it was an easy fit for us because they wanted to do the same things that we knew that Joan is famous for and will be famous for in the future. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's about truly understanding yourselves before you can understand what clients make sense to you and then sticking to that and sticking to those values in a really true and honest way. Yeah, I mean, it's the core value proposition question that every CMO and every brand has to answer, but uh, agencies should as well. Uh, so we've talked about so much about what it means to be a marketer. Tom, if you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Well, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> you know, I think I think it's one of those things that I I think changes constantly. Um, but we've talked a lot about authenticity, and to me, that's fundamental of any marketer and any person. I I want to ensure that people understand me and understand the the messages that we as a brand are trying to do. Um, in a way that feels true. And I think, you know, at the beginning of this chat, Daniel, you talked about marketers sort of have this perception of trying to constantly pull the wool over your eyes and pull the wool over consumers' eyes and, and clients' eyes. And I think that is never the case for me. And I think that is what makes a strong marketer, someone who's going to be honest, who's going to say, you'd be nuts to do this, but you'd be nuts not to do this in that same, in that same breath, uh, because it will only help break those conventions and can, and drive even less traditional work and work that really changes the world. Well, to your theme, I mean, our goal here is to have some authentic conversations on how I made it marketing about this industry, about this life, about what we do. I think, I hope we achieved that today, Tom. I learned a lot from you. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And I've had a really good time. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.